Hey people, it's Casper from Silver Tiger Media and we are very proud indeed to be talking with the supremely talented Luca Turelli. Ciao Luca, come stai? Ciao my friend, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Don't <laughs> use too, too, too nice words for me. <laughs> I don't deserve <laughs> that. <laughs> Grazie mille for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, no, it's my pleasure, my goal to make uh, interviews in Australia. I'm so happy, I'm so happy. We need to promote our music in your wonderful country. Indeed. Firstly, congratulations on Prometheus Symphonia Ignis Divinus, The Fire of the Divine. What a sensational whirlwind of symphony. It's molto bello. You must be very proud. Oh my God, you're so good in Italian. Wow. Oh, grazie. <laughs> You must be very proud of the the album. Well, yes, I mean, uh, <laughs> you can imagine seven months of composition, three months of uh, production with all the recording and so on, and almost two months of uh, mix. So, yes, after, you know, I, I closed myself in the studio. It was March uh, 2014, and uh. I came out in March 2015. So imagine, I came out, an album done, but, but uh, one year of life gone. <laughs> uh, indeed. It's due for release on June 19th through Nuclear Blast and is magnifico, a, a moving journey of discovery on so many levels. Ah, too nice. No, you know, for me, I intend the music of Rhapsody, like really the connection between uh, melody, so the melodic aspect, uh, aspect of heavy metal, and uh, the connection with the cinematic impact uh, uh, typical of the soundtrack uh, sound. So that's what, for me, Rhapsody is about. So I try to give my best in, in that direction. <laughs> see, see. And this is the first album with Alex Landenberg on drums after uh, Alex Holdsworth left the band. Do you think the name Alex is important in a drummer? <laughs> no, Alex is, is, is really amazing. And um, really, it was the first time, usually, you, you know, when I composed by myself, I create also the demos for the drums. Normally, then we were sending in the past uh, the drum parts to Alex Olsa. Then we were meeting in the studio. Then uh, from time to time, he was proposing some uh, some uh, improvements, of course, uh, because uh, of course I'm not a drummer, no. So you can <laughs> just get some uh, good uh, good uh, ideas from a real drummer. Uh, and it was always like that. But this time, it, was, it happened something incredible because it was the first time that we were working with Alex Landenburg, as you said. And yeah. uh, when I sent him the demo with all the songs I composed, he sent me back uh, the demo with completely different parts. I, was, I became totally crazy, you know, because we didn't have uh, so much time <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> no? I was close to the deadline. Um, and so... I was totally shocked because, you know, Alex Landemur comes from uh, this progressive uh, side of heavy metal. He's a big yes. fan of uh, Mike Mangini. He played in Annihilator. So you, you, you can imagine, no? And for us, <laughs> it was quite complicated. They were quite complicated, his, his part that he proposed. So I said, oh, my God, what do we have now? But the great thing is that after, I tried to simplify most of the parts that he sent me, and they think the, the drum part that came out from this uh, teamwork that I had for the first time with a, with a drummer, then it gave birth, I think, to the best part I ever had, in a, the best drum part I ever had in a, in a Rhapsody album. And so I'm really, really happy. And so we will go on, I think, work in such a way. <laughs> oh, benissimo. Look, I hope you will forgive my personal question. You defeated cancer at the age of only 21. How much of that personal triumph in your life influences your music today? Well, I have to say that my life was quite uh, different from an average life already when I was a child, you know. Yes. Um, I was a very spiritual person immediately without knowing it. You know, when you're a child, you don't know it. It's your mother telling to you after some years what you were doing. I was totally attracted by these, uh, you know, ghost stories, uh, supernatural phenomenon, parapsychology, like that. So I was mm. kind of a particular person, no? Um, and then when I had this episode in 1993, as you said, okay, there was no chance. The doctor was saying, ah, there is nothing to do. We can try to make a chemotherapy. 
but he could die also of the same chemotherapy because it will be quite hard. Yes. Uh, but well, and my mother say, okay, let's go for it. Uh, but then the miracle happened, and uh, of course the doctors cannot explain anything, no, because uh, sometimes it's just unexpl- unexplainable. Yes. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, in the end, that uh, I would say even more pushed me in the spiritual direction, and that's why when we created uh, with my ex colleague Alex Taropoli in 1997 Rhapsody. The basic things, apart from what I told you before about the love for cinematic music, for the melodic side of heavy metal, uh, the, the third element was the, the will to give a positive message through our music. At the time, it was full of satanist bands, uh, things like that, you know, uh, spreading evil messages, things like that, more or less serious, of course, you know, because then yes. I, I, knew, I know a lot of black metal bands where the guys are the most kind in the world, they will not even uh, heart an end <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> so, <Intriga>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, at that time, really, for us, it was very important to break through and uh, really push this message that is a uh, Really, we, we wanted to intend the uh, Rhapsody's music like a really hymn to life and really um, let understand the people to, to, that it's not worth to live life in a bored way, you know? Yes. There are so, much, so many things to discover, to enjoy this wonderful existence on this wonderful planet that uh, is enough to change the attitude, the energy, and then what you give, you get back in a positive way. So... Uh, this was our message, uh, thanks to our music, uh, and this is, for me, the best part, no? Uh, mm-hmm. Since when I created Rhapsody, when you read in Facebook the messages of many people, that thanks to our music, they came out from drugs, they came out, they improved their life quality, uh, they, they solved some situation complicated with their own family, things like that, no? So these are the greatest satisfaction, because in some way, I feel the artist is responsible of the message he gives, yes. and uh, in my case, it could have not been any different, no? I was always kind of a positive person. If you would know me personally, you would understand. People don't know many aspects of my daily life, no? But me, I'm mm. a guy that uh, really, I cannot heart, even me, uh, an ant on the floor, so uh, even if I, by mistake, kill an insect, I, I am totally, uh, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I, um, I understand. Not in, yes, I feel totally bad, so yes. it's like this, I think, you transmit what you are, so mm. that's why uh, then the energy moves even in a more... Uh, um, excited way, in a more, how to say, winning uh, way, you know, if you really strongly believe in what you do and the message you want to transmit. And then, of course, which other kind of music, more than the bombastic music, choral, orchestra, to underline even more, with more emotional strength, such message. Yes, yes, indeed. And with the album itself, Alessandro Conti provides magnificent voice to the, the lyrics. Ah, thank you, thank you. Alessandro was a great discover. Uh, you know, already we had it uh, for the first time in Ascending to Infinity, our previous album. So, yes, I remember when I sent him all the songs and I tested him uh, on many different tracks to, to really understand his vocal possibility, to discover more about his possibilities. And uh, it was amazing because I, I sent him, you know, for me, a Rhapsody singer, because of the Rhapsody variety uh, I can offer uh, uh, musical variety I can offer as composer. It's important always for me to have a singer able to express himself in different vocal colors. So mm. it's just not enough if he's able to sing in these high range melodies, and he was uh, already excellent at that. But then, thanks to these demos that I sent to him, that I asked to sing back, uh, to get back, I discovered really his potential, for example, in the operatic way of singing. Uh, then I discovered even that uh, he, he studied lyrical singing at the same school of uh, Pavarotti, of Luciano Pavarotti, the famous I singer. See. Really? So, yes, it was amazing. And uh, so, oh, why not? I also offer in some songs of the album, of this Prometheus album, also yes. some uh, different uh, <laughs> songs uh, <laughs> that uh, show off a little bit uh, about um, Al- Alessandro possibilities. 
Mm, wonderful. I, do, I have to ask you, if I may, about the, the cover art. It's beautiful. Would you tell us a little bit about the cover art? Yes. You know, this is a new artist that collaborated for us for the first time. Uh, is Stefan Heilemann. And uh, he's also responsible, probably you know, of uh, the cover of bands like Epica, for example, no? Yes, yes. And, yes, he's working for many bands of Nuclear Blast. And um, I already had the chance to, to work. There was the possibility for, for the previous album. But then I don't know why it didn't happen, so I went on with my old uh, artist. And, uh, but I have a really to say that for the first time, I'm really proud that 100% of the graphical result because you know this was something that was always missing to me i was always suffering in some way for that despite the great uh, artworks we had in the past some of them i love them but uh, you know what i really missed a little bit what what peter jackson was able to do with the movies of lord of the rings you know when i came up i was loving these fantasy oriented movies there were movies like Willow, there was music, movies like The NeverEnding Story, things like that, you know. But yes. uh, for the first time on the screen, uh, it was Peter Jackson who was able to represent in a serious way the fantasy world, for example, in that case of Tolkien. So, yes. uh, in the same way for Rhapsody, I always imagined uh, as everything is... Uh, extremely serious musically and lyrically but sometimes it was just because of the artworks that the people who didn't like Rhapsody they were always uh, minimizing our world telling us ah, that childish uh, they, they speak about ch childish fairy tales things like that no and mm. uh, while the, contra the, the contrary the, the, the truth is the contrary while there were uh, hermetic uh, meanings hidden meanings behind the, the superficial lyrics no we were yes. offering always two keys for reading the reading there were different interpretations and so on if you know a little bit more about spirituality things like that uh, you can discover a lot in the lyrics even of the saga of rhapsody no so of to course. which all the music and lyrics were related for the first 10 albums so i would say that now thanks to this new graphical approach everything get more serious, also under the, 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 the visual aspect. And uh, as we define uh, ourselves as a cinematic metal band, also the visual aspect, you can imagine, can be very, very important. Mm, tremendously so. And as you mentioned, Lord of the Rings, One Ring to Rule Them All is a tremendously powerful piece with sensational guitar rips. What is happening in our story during this track? Well, no, no, this is a moment uh, of the movie, let's say, is a resume, no, of a part mm. uh, of the movie, and uh, this uh, really was inspired uh, to me, there was no plan in the beginning to write a song about Lord of the Rings, but then two years ago, it happened that um, I, I traveled to New Zealand, Yes. And, uh, well, it was an incredible experience. Now, there was a friend who invited me and my girlfriend uh, to see the location of the movies and all that. And I have to say that I heard many great things about, uh, of course, Australia, New Zealand, all these incredible countries, no? Uh oh, great. Uh, but when I came there, for me, it was a shock, an emotional shock, because apart, mm. because, of course, you, you know the movie, so you remember the, the, the location, all that. But when you are there such nature, you know, for Rhapsody, we always sang in our songs about the beauty of the natural landscape, that's an important element, you know, also very yes. spiritual in some way. And uh, when I was there with such special vegetation, a, little, a, a kind of mix between the Alps in Europe and mm -hmm. uh, this exotic vegetation that you can find just in, in your beautiful countries, no? In yes, Oceania. Yes. Um, so uh, it was so amazing that when I came back, uh, I really had all this emotion and I felt the need to trap such emotions in a song. So it came spontaneously like, like that. You know? It was one of the Wonderful. last titles composed uh, for the album. And so it was just great you know, because uh, it's a kind of connection with the atmosphere of the movies, of the natural landscapes of New Zealand. Oh, wow. And that explains why the track is so powerful. Yggdrasil is, again, an extremely profound and beautiful track with interludes of flute, uh, tremendous blends of harpsichord and guitar. I'm presuming the subject is the immense tree from Norse mythology linking the nine worlds? 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, you have to know that uh, apart from the saga, but also about that I could speak hours and hours because, as I told you, we were hiding hidden messages, things like that, always, of course, extremely positive, no? Inspired yes. by light, love, uh, the such positive values, respect, and so on. But uh, uh, now, after the saga, I decided to face different subjects in different songs, no? Apart yes. from a composition point uh, of view, it's fantastic because I can use different sounds in every song. I offer a lot of variety, musical variety throughout the, the album. But uh, what is important is that uh, all these subjects, like the Yggdrasil, like uh, other songs of the albums, are... Uh, I can speak about different things, yes, but everything is related about the main theme that is for me uh, connecting all the reps of the music and lyrics, and we are speaking about spiritual evolution. Uh, yes. Spiritual, of course, has nothing to do with uh, religions, no? Religion. Mm. This is something beyond, <laughs> before, I would say, any religion, no? So I'm interested really into this primordial spiritual source. I, in that I'm interested. What uh, the scientists now define uh, as uh, primordial photonic energy. And uh, it's great to see you know, that it's the same thing as uh, uh, what uh, the ancient cultures, uh, Egyptians, uh, whatever, uh, also uh, religions, Buddhist, uh, Catholic, they, they, they define a spiritual light, no? the spiritual yes. light of the creation. So uh, you can see the, the, the things under different perspectives, but we are speaking about the same uh, subject. So the spiritual evolution for me is fundamental, and all the music, so also for example in the case of Yggdrasil, yes, I speak about Nordic mythology, but I like to underline, to offer a double way of reading the re lyrics, and really you can, uh, if you know something about, yes, like you said, the, the walls, the, the spiritual evolution, you can understand much more. That's very, very interesting, because I was going to ask you about the uh, track on the album, we have uh, the reference to the legendary tale of King Solomon, the, the spiritual mystery related to the Shem Ha Mephorash, uh, the 72 names of God. Yeah. I was going to ask if that's biblical in, the, uh, biblical in nature or philosophical, but of course the, the answer would be philosophical. <laughs> Not really. You know what? I discovered something incredible. You have to know, if you know more about my life, you know, I told you until, until the moment of the cancer before, and yes. uh, that was an important moment. But that, uh, as I told you, that moment uh, pushed me in the direction of searching for uh, comprehension, no? the comprehension of... I mean, you know, we typically artists, we always ask ourselves, um, not only the artists, the people more sensitive to uh, what are we doing on this planet, from where we come, where do we go, no? Mm. So at a certain point, you can read books, you can be fascinated by these subjects, you can learn a lot of things, but as you say, it stays philosophical, it stays, say, you understand, but then at a the point of your life, you say, and then, and what? So I, I, I really have to tell you that since when I started practicing and experimenting on myself the things, then is that moment that life changes completely. Because mm. thanks to yoga, thanks to meditation, this kind of high-level practices of breathing, breathing techniques uh, um, from the Tibetan monks, uh, all, all these kind of things, are, are things that really, before I was... Before, before I, I define it like this, before it is about believing or not believing. After, when you do this and you practice the things on your skin, on yourself, you can test everything on yourself independently, independently from what you read in the book, then mm. is the moment that, uh, uh, how to say, uh, you understand the, the things, how the things work, no? As you get, yeah. so in some way you get closer to the truth. Uh, what we are doing here, what, where do we go, all this. But these are things that you have to practice really on yourself. No? Yes. So before you can read thousands of books, but it's just blah, 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 blah. No? Yes, uh, in so, uh, in, in the, yes, in the same way, also a person who comes, uh, who is totally living into the, exclusively into the material perspective, then he can just not understand or judge the spiritual perspective, because it's another world, and you can understand it only when you put, when you step a feet 
in that direction too. And I can tell you when you have one fit in the material perspective and one in the spiritual perspective, your quality life improves dramatically. Uh, mm. Your Im immune uh, system gets uh, improved. Uh, I mean, there are just benefits also from an health point of view. So it's incredible. It's really something incredible. And of course, I speak uh, about all these subjects, but in a hidden way, uh, in all my music, music of uh, lyrics of Rhapsody. Yeah, so now can I prompt you to tell us what the quantum key partially revealed through the encrypted lyrics of Prometheus is? <laughs> yes, this is something really particular because, um, you know, for me the important is, is right to this, no? Like in the hermetic tradition, you have to say something, but then uh, uh, only the people who are interested and in that... Uh, because of their experience of life, they, they feel connected to this kind of thing, then they can get the meaning of the lyrics in a deeper way. And this is fundamental for me. No? It's like the typical tradition of the hermetic, uh, how to say, literature and whatever. No? Mm -hmm. So in some way, uh, I, I created this mini saga, I would say a mini concept, you can define it like this, that connects yes. various songs of my new Luca Turilli's Rhapsody Adventure. For example, we have uh, the songs from our previous album, Quantum Mix, uh, Ascending to Infinity, Dark Fate of Atlantis, and the, the song uh, of Michael, the Archangel, and Lucifer's Fall, that are yes. part of this mini concept ba based on metaphysics, science, uh, um, spiritual evolution, of course. That's the main subject, the heart. Uh, and then... The, the mini concept goes on with the intro, Nova Genesis, um, the song you said now, you name now Prometheus, and yes. then it goes on with uh, of Michael the Archangel's uh, Lucifer's Fall, part two, Codex Nemesis. And then this mini concept will go on with other three or four titles in the next album. And then mm -hmm. I, I will close it. So it's a particular subject. If you, if you take all the songs and you listen to them consecutively, and you read the lyrics especially, uh, one after the other, uh, I think if you know something about the subject, you can really get uh, what, uh, what all is about. Absolutely, you do indeed. It's, a, it's, not, yeah. a, it's not a saga, it's not something like a saga, a tale, no? Even if the mm. sagas, the, the tales, they anyway uh, hide some symbolically or whatever, some, some messages like that. But this is really something that I studied and uh, I experimented based on the ancient um, cultures, you know, uh, all these things in connection with the scientific, uh, recent scientific discoveries. You know, I have a lot of contact with, with uh, physicians, with scientists. We always speak about these things. We, we make experiments, things. So uh, in some way, this mini concept, this mini saga uh, includes a little bit of all this. So it's, it's really something that it, for me is much more than a, just a tale or a saga. You know what I mean? Sure, I do, absolutely. The uh, All building to the finale of 18 minutes, which is simply breathtaking. I wish I had the vocabulary to adequately describe the emotions elicited. Would you please oh take God, us... Oh, my thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Would you take us through the, the five movements of the, the last piece? Yes, yes. Okay, this... Um... It's very important song for is a very important song for me as I told you because it's the heart of this mini saga in some yes. way where I speak a, a little bit more about this uh, codex uh, nemesis that is the, the alpha omega the yes. As the, yes yes the code of the code and um, in some way okay of course I don't like to say too much no because I don't want to <laughs> of course <laughs> to waste the concept behind the song that uh, is hermetic but uh, what I can say is that uh, I really, for this song, I really wanted to, to have such connection, no, between, um, it's a moment where, let's say, it's difficult to, to explain this in a, in a different language, mm -hmm. um, but I would say that uh, with that song, uh, in some way, you have the, the, the Codex Nemesis, I could say just this, no? to, to make it simple for you. The Codex mm -hmm. Nemesis represents all the questions unanswered by the, the human being. No? So yeah, in yeah. some way, 
the typical questions that also the, a simple person can have at first uh, when just living in the material perspective. So, but uh, if there is a, uh, a God, you know, there is the good and the evil, why, why a little child uh, uh, dies in such a way, you know, um, mm. or uh, whatever, like uh, the typical questions, you know, that uh, it seems almost like there is no nonsense in some way, you know. Uh, why the good people uh, they have this problem? Maybe a, a, a better guy, uh, everything is going fine to him, uh, or things like that. All the, the, the things that apparently, let's say, have no meaning, you know, mm. from a from a spiritual point of view. Yes, uh, yes, it's indeed. kind of this. No, so the Codex Nemesis represents a little bit uh, the secret. Uh, when when this code of the codes uh, gets revealed. The people have the tool for the comprehension of uh, all these things. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know when there is a war, no? Uh, mm. The people say, how can a god allow something like that? Or uh, things like that, no? A god based on love and things like that. And so the Codex Nemesis, when understood, uh, can reveal all this. So I would say the secret of the universe in some way. Yes, yes, indeed. Beautifully put, too. And, uh, of course, I won't press you on the uh, Symphonia Ignis Divino, so I think that's quite important, the quantum gate revealed. We don't want to give anything away there. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to reveal too much. But, uh, no, in some way, uh, let me think what I can say. Um, Yes, of course, we can say that the simple thing, no? I, I, um, I, there is the myth of Prometheus, uh, a kind of connection between the Prometheus of the movie, you know? I was a big yes. fan of the, the movie of Prometheus, and of course the, the ancient myth of Prometheus, so the fire of the god given to the man for their spiritual evolution in some way, no? Mm -hmm. You can intend yes. it like that. Ah, oh, wonderful. Uh, beautifully put. Uh, right down to the, if we go to the, the fifth movement, uh, the system overload, it's a mix of ancient and modern. It's such a beautiful blend, but there seems to be a lunar discovery at the finale. No, I, I think this is really what I wanted to get, you know. Uh, these are songs, also the first part of Michael in the previous uh, album of Michael D'Archangel. There is yes. this connection, yes, between past, uh, uh, there is no time in, in some way, you know. In that song, uh, past and future because uh, become part of an eternal present, no? So there is mm -hmm. no distinction. And this is a very spiritual, this concept, no? When they tell you all the, the, you got to speak with the Tibetan monks, no? The people very spiritual that have time to dedicate uh, themselves to this spiritual path. The first time uh, they tell you is time doesn't exist, no? Mm -hmm. uh, is our uh, ego with our uh, inside that we feel the present, uh, the, 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 sorry, the, the past, in the future, but in reality, we are living this eternal present, and we have to be concentrated at, any, in, at every moment, any time, in that specific moment that is the present, no? Why we mm. waste simply energy thinking about the problem of the past and the problems that we will have in the future. So the, what is typical for the modern man, right? Mm. Uh, so it's a little bit about of this, no? In the, uh, in the system overloaded, is about uh, letting understand the people that uh, if you concentrate on the present, then you, you can have the maximum amount of energy uh, that allows you to, to face what for you becomes the future in a completely with, uh, with the enough energy to face uh, such, uh, such journey, no? That is life. So... I know I have many difficulties now to find the words to explain because it's, it's quite complicated. It know? is, but you, you're doing very, very well, I must say. <laughs> I, I can give you some fragments here and there. Uh, so, but then uh, really the people should should uh, because I also we we release uh, the, in the third album, let's say the the the, the, the following, you no, know, of all these. So, and I will give the tools to all the people. Uh, to, to, to arrive to understand something more and more. And mm. uh, I think it's great because the people who like the stuff are fascinated by the stuff. They can discover much more, no? Yes. Um, and I like, I like this. I don't like to be too explicit about that because uh, this is the typical spiritual thing, you know? Like, you know, the Tibetan monks, as I said before, all these, mm. they, they transmit 
generation after generation this incredible ancient uh, knowledge. Uh, so it's incredible, no? Many, um, you know, about this Kabbalah thing, uh, things like that. It was taught only after 40 years old, no? When the student had the experience of life, when he was understanding much more. So I don't think this is something for everybody. Uh, mm. It's something that you don't have the, to force the people to understand because I think uh, it, it comes a moment for some people that they feel totally attracted by this and then it's their moment. Uh, other people, if they just don't feel to, to they just are happy with their uh, material, living in their material perspective, that's absolutely fine. Oh, fantastic. Good. Well, look, I have to say again, congratulations. I, I, and I wish I had the vocabulary to ac accurately describe it. Uh, perhaps some Latin, uh, admiratone spiciendum, <laughs> wondrous, would be would be best to describe yeah, it. Yeah, you know, for me it was very important to add the variety also in the sense, not only musically, but also from a lyrical point of view, because, uh, you know, also it's very good because uh, when you have an album of 70 minutes of Rhapsody, it can be really overwhelming in some way. So if I would use just one language, the English, one style of orchestration, like this could get uh, boring even for me that I composed it, no? <laughs> so for me it's very yes. important. That's why I like to use different choirs, different voices, different languages. We have three songs sung in Italian. Um, then, uh, like you said, we have a lot of Latin parts, uh, a lot of, uh, yes, also in King Solomon, we have some ancient words uh, in Hebrew, etc. So, mm -hmm. yes, yes, this is very fundamental. Also because this connects you more and more to the mystery contained in the lyrics. Yeah, absolutely, and tremendously so. You were working, in fact, with two choirs, several guest performers, including uh, Ralph Sheepers from Primal Fear, Dan Lucas from Caro, David Reedman from Pink Cream 69. Is no dream too big for you to manifest in reality? <laughs> okay, this is a kind of uh, hard task, you know. Already to have an orchestra is a kind of uh, <laughs> difficult thing on stage, no? You've always organized the things like in a very special way to be able to, to aff afford such cost. But uh, no, for the moment, you know, people are already happy when we present our live shows, for example, with this uh, cinematic uh, approach. That's why we define then w with the word cinem. We had always the word cinematic to present our tour, no? So, for example, the next one will be the Prometheus cinematic tour is because we use the video projection. So this is already a big work that I have to do, preparing a lot of visual stuff to present our shows live. So that are already a big task. We are already speaking now. There are many choirs and orchestras asking me to perform some shows with Rhapsody. It's always a difficult thing to, to be organized, of course, no? Of course. You can think to do something like that, uh, to record, for example, a live show to record it and then to release it as a DVD, whatever. Uh, that's a, that could be a great idea for, for us in the future, but um, for the moment that's already the, the maximum we can offer, and I think it's a lot because the fans really show that they appreciate such a, such a presentation. So uh, that's for the moment, of course. Then, uh, I mean, now we are growing incredibly, no? After, mm -hmm. you know, there was the split with my old uh, colleague of Rhapsody of Fire, that we kind of not restarted from zero, but we restarted, and now it's incredible. Now already the, 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 the sales of this uh, new album, the pre-sales, uh, tripled compared to the one of the previous album. So everything is growing, growing, growing now uh, back. It's, it's just amazing, no? So, uh, yes, why not? In the future, we can think to everything if uh, all proceeds in, in this exact way. And do you think there's a chance you might come to Australia and perform for us here? Yeah, this is uh, our uh, our big thing, you know, our big goal. And, uh, you know, since many years we're speaking about that. And uh, as I told you, as the things become bigger and bigger, then there are more possibilities also in that sense. We have a lot of bands of our friends that came over there. They told us just great things about uh, the people. Um, so, I mean, uh, we just, you know, as I always like to say, no, I don't like to say, but I have to say, uh, <laughs> the fact is that we are, you know, uh, Rhapsod is a multinational, so we are one guy from Germany, Alex Landenburg, then we have uh, two uh, bass player and second guitar player from France, then mm. me and uh, Alessandro from Italy, and then we have our guest keyboard player, Mikko Harkin, from Finland. 
So already is a big cost to put everybody together just yeah. for, a, for a single date in Europe, no? So that's why until now we have some logistic problem, expensive things like that. So if you, you have to come to Australia, you have to organize a well-planned, well-thought tour, uh, touching many different countries, no? In the rest, yeah. outside, outside Europe. So uh, now we change a new agency. It also depends from the work of the agency. But I would say I, I'm, I'm sure that as we go now, we will go to Japan, uh, South America, whatever. Then there are many big changes that we will be also over there. Oh, wonderful, wonderful news. Well, to, uh, look, uh, we, thank you very much for, for talking to us today, and we thank you it was very my much. Pleasure, for, absolutely, my friend. Oh, really, and really for the nice, album, it's uh, wonderful. Guy. Uh, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Glancy. Uh, and um, please be safe and be well, and we hope to catch up with you in Australia very, very soon. Absolutely, absolutely. I come for that, maybe already in the beginning or in the very end, because in November we are in Europe. So could be ah, that or in yes. December or in January we are outside of Europe, so maybe we could give you a surprise in that sense uh, very soon. Let's see. Oh. I'm really crossing my fingers. But it Benissimo. doesn't matter. Sooner or later now, uh, after this release, we should be there anyway because uh, I don't see any obstacles for that. Oh, wonderful. We'll look forward to that very much indeed. Luca, thank you very kindly for your time. Thank you, Rohan. You have a beautiful name, you know. It reminds me Lord of the Rings. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Of course, the writers of Rohan. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you again for your time. We'll look forward Thanks to seeing you. Thanks to you, my friend. Uh, all the best. Uh, have a good night, then. <laughs> Ciao, grazie. Grazie a te, caro. Ciao, ci vediamo. Ciao. Ciao.